Everybody from Taiwan, hello. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you because this is Inspire's High, Inspire High's first truly global session inviting people from all over the world. And this is the first time we're attempting this in English. So it's my first time. So I may stumble, I may mumble, but I will not crumble. So please be excited for today's session. Um, please send your comments in from the comment section and I'll try to pick up as many as possible. And I hope you are as excited as I am for today's session inviting Mr. Audrey, Miss Audrey Tang. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Hi, eto, Inspire Hi, minasan tanoshimu kotsu desu ga, komento ran karo sanka, zehi onegaishimasu. I'm also checking the comments from where I am at through my phone. Um, so please send in your comments and I'll try to pick up as many as I can. It's, there's so many people today that it's very difficult for me to follow everything, but I will try my best. Let's start the session. Let's invite uh, Audrey and let's get rolling. Uh, hi, Audrey. Audrey-san, konnichiwa. Hi, Audrey. How are you today? Hello. How's everyone? Good local time, everyone. Live long and prosper, everyone. <laughs> Live long and prosper. So, Audrey, where are you today? Can you hear me? Sure. Uh, I'm not only hearing you, I'm also hearing you as of about 10 seconds ago. So, so I'm now hearing two versions of you, just like in the movie Tenet. I'm in the administration office. I'm okay. also hearing my own voice as I answer uh, your first question. So it seems that we're having a lot of feedback, but from ourselves. And this is how my office looks like. It has a recording of our mm -hmm. conversation, has a very large whiteboard, mm -hmm. a wall that we use to project ideas. That's a projector mm -hmm. and some sofa as well. Awesome. So is that where you uh, usually work from? So it is where I uh, perform this kind of online interactions. It's my uh -huh. studio. Uh, my actual workplace is rather mostly in the social innovation lab, which mm -hmm. is not a studio, but rather a park that everybody and their dog and their self-driving vehicles can visit me. Whoa, that's really cool. So how, how much of your time do you spend in that innovation lab? Every Wednesday from 10 a.m. Uh, to the late evening, I'm there and everybody can talk to me. And I'm also there every other Tuesday or Friday too, when I tour around Taiwan and use this kind of video conference to work with people. Mm -hmm. Wow, has the, um, the touring portion become difficult because of the COVID? Uh, in Taiwan, we never had a lockdown. So the touring, while of course we all have to wear the medical masks, that we ration out, but if we keep the mask on, if three quarter of people wear it, the mm -hmm. R value is always under one. So mm -hmm. it's all working pretty well. It never stopped. Awesome. So before I go into the topic of today's conversation, I just want to encourage both of us to have a look at the comments. So we got a lot of people joining from all over Japan, as well as Taiwan, and I'm sure around the world today. And we got some comments coming in. Um, Mona-san, Audrey, your English is so beautiful. Um, Nikita-san, surprised that Taiwan didn't have a lockdown. Uh, we have a lot of questions already coming in. Um, and Aotana-san is, um, has a comment to your innovation lab. Whoa, that's so cool, it's literally a park. Um, <laughs> Adi-san asking you to invite people to Taiwan. Uh, so we have a lot of comments. So everybody who's on the other side um, watching the session today, I encourage you to ask as many questions as you would like, and I'm going to try my best to pick them up. So please, we encourage your participation, and thanks for joining us today. So we touched slightly on the subject of the masks, 
And I was supposed to ask a quiz at the very beginning of this session today, but I completely forgot and went straight into the session. So I just want to speak a little bit um, about uh, the mask map which you created. So in Japan, there's a lot of reporting that says that it took three days for the system to be created and then for you to deploy the data and so on and so forth and for it to spread. But can you tell us a little bit about what the mask map was um, and is and the process in which it came into uh, being? Sure. The mask map, which is a map that we use to ration, um, is created by the civil society people such as the Gov Zero initiative and so on. And these are important because in the beginning of the pandemic, we have very limited production probabilities of people getting a mask on a free market as low because at the time we only produced 2 million medical masks a day in a country of 23 million people. Of course, we will ramp up it to more than 20 million a day uh, in the following months, I think by April or May. But in the first three months, there was a real shortage for the medical masks. Mm -hmm. Because of that, we devised a system where everybody can use their national health insurance card that mm -hmm. covers more than 99.99% of all the citizens and residents too. And they can go to their nearby pharmacies where the pharmacists are professional and trusted by the community to get initially only two medical masks per week and next mm -hmm. three medical masks per week and now nine medical masks per two weeks, or if you are a child, then 10 per two week. This is important because the affordability and accessibility is more important than the number of masks you have. Mm -hmm. You can use, for example, a traditional rice cooker uh, to clean the mask for reuse for mm -hmm. a couple of days in the very beginning. But mm -hmm. if only a small fraction of people have access to masks, then the virus will spread in the community. So mm -hmm. people helped, instead of having to queue very long lines, mm -hmm. you can see in real time where the pharmacies are. And if they are in green, it means they still have available stock. If mm -hmm. they are in red, it means that it runs out of stock. You don't have to, um, try arrow <laughs> and then uh, it shows the number in real time so that when the people queuing before you make a purchase you can see the number go down just a minute by refreshing this map and this map is created more than 100 of them created by the citizens we just make sure that they have their real-time number so everybody can hold this system to account mm -hmm. Yeah, we got a lot of comments coming in. Masaki-san, that is a great system. Tama-chan, that's so great. Um, yeah, we have a lot of people who are, I guess, astonished at the at the way that Taiwan has responded to this. And I am aware that that has led to global coverage over the way that Taiwan has, in a sense, contained uh, the, the COVID pandemic and the mask map being really extremely effective in uh, realizing that. Um, a lot of people are extremely, um, they're mind blown by the speed at which it happened. And we have a lot of comments with three days with a, with a huge exclamation mark coming afterwards. Um, and I think what's really fascinating here is that it's a, it's a collaboration of a, of a, of a, of a team of civic, uh, um, of, I guess, hackers who initially created the mask and then, uh, a, a collaboration with, uh, the government, which, further enhanced uh, the credibility and trustability and usability of that. Um, and it, do you think this is something that's unique to Taiwan, this level of collaboration between the people and the government? It's always like that for each major disaster. And Japan is not strange to that idea too. I mean, the application called LINE 
was invented because of the large earthquake and people mm. need a way to keep communication open even if they run out of electricity for example they still can use the battery in their phone to send short messages to mm -hmm. each other so i'm sure with the typhoons and earthquake japanese people can understand how important it is for all the different sectors to come together just today we have the anniversary of the major earthquake back in 99 it's called mm -hmm. the september 21st and this is our national disaster prevention day mm -hmm. on 9 a.m and 21 minutes afterward like 9 21 9 21 everybody's phone received this sms that mm -hmm. is a drill that reminds people to work together to work with the earthquake disaster prevention and mm -hmm. timely response so this is in our culture and especially amplified around the turn of the century mm -hmm. wow thank you so i want to pivot a little bit towards um asking about your history your personal history and about your upbringing and your life and so what i'm gonna do um is i'm going to ask uh the staff to bring up a little screen um which describes your upbringing screen niテロップの方出していただけますかありがとうございます so i'm gonna read this out for everybody so at the age of eight oji you started learning coding Um, at the age of 14, you drop out from middle school. At the age of 19, you start a software company in Silicon Valley. At the age of 24, you come out uh, about your gender identity and you change your name. Um, and at 33, you announce the end of your business career and become an IT minister. Is this accurate? Is there anything that's wrong here? I just want to make sure that we're not sending false information out into the world. Huh. Um, well, except that I'm not a IT minister. I mean, digital you're a digital minister. IT, uh, while being the enabling technology of digital, is actually different concepts. Digital is about the society, people to people mm -hmm. relationship. IT mm -hmm. is about the machine to machine relationships. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it is fine. I'm also happy that we fixed the feedback problem on our side. So this is good now. <laughs> good. I'm glad. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, you're right. So I think what's fascinating there is that um, the central component when you say digital is the people, whereas the central component when you say IT is just the machine. Um, so we have a lot of people uh, sending in a lot of comments. Um, but it seems that the, the biggest point of fascination for everybody here um, is how you started programming at the age of eight, or you started studying programming at the age of eight. Can you tell us a little bit about what prompted you to do that? Sure. Uh, I had a, a few uh, family relatives, uh, a couple of uncles, uh, who already work uh, respectively uh, in the Acer, uh, which is a large uh, computer um, company uh, at the time, still quite large now. Uh, mm -hmm. And also one uh, work at an information industry institute. So it's natural that they would have um, the programming language books uh, in the bookshelf. Uh, so I just read those books because I was very into mathematics, but I don't like calculation at all. So uh, I found out, oh, there is this computing machine that can handle all the calculation for me so I can focus on the concepts of mathematics instead of math calculations. So mm -hmm. I started programming on a piece of paper using pencil to draw the keyboard uh, and then uh, write the prompt uh, and type on the paper like CLS enter and then use a eraser to erase the paper screen. Um, and after a few weeks, my parents uh, bought me a personal computer. Mm -hmm. Wow, so it must have accelerated from there when your parents bought you the computer. What were the first things that you were programming? Uh, I wrote, I think, print, uh, double quote, hello world, double mm -hmm. quote. Okay, wow, so you remember your very first uh, piece of code. 
So before we step into the other um, parts of your uh, of your life, I kind of want to ask a question for all the Japanese people here who are here today. Um, there's a lot of culture exchange between Japan and Taiwan, and I was wondering, was there any like Anime or any kind of culture that came from Japan that you were fascinated by or that you followed when you grew up? Well, certainly. I read the original uh, manga series uh, of Ghost in the Shell. Ghost in the which, Shell. Yeah, which is more like an illustrated textbook. Uh, okay. Than, uh, uh, but later on, of course, I would also watch the TV uh, series. Uh -huh. uh, also, uh, the movie uh, adaptation, uh, and of course, it's Hollywood derivative uh, called The Matrix. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. So the original story of The Matrix is Japanese? Yes, of course. Um, and I think the uh, Wiskowski directors uh, openly admits uh, that it's inspired heavily by Ghost in the Shell. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. So we have some questions coming in. Um, oh, how about this one? So we have a comment from Saito-san. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, that's the one, isn't it? Ghost in the Shell. That must be what it's called in Japanese. Wow, okay. Yeah, in Mandarin, it's called Gongke Jidong Dui, but we are talking about the same thing. Okay, okay. Really cool. Right, so we share a lot of cultural background as well. I just wanted to kind of touch on that because I think um, that's something that a lot of people in Japan don't really know about uh, Taiwan and how we actually share a lot of cultural background. So I'm really happy that we were able to speak of that. <laughs> we got a lot of comments coming in. All right, so my next question for you is um, when you were 14 and you decided to drop out of uh, middle school, um, can you tell us a little bit about that experience and the challenges you may have faced during that period of your life? Yeah, I imagined that um, I will have to go to a senior high and then uh, go to a college and maybe get a doctorate to work with the leading researchers, for example, on artificial intelligence. And uh, nowadays we would call it natural language processing, uh, which mm -hmm. is science fair project at a time. Uh, mm -hmm. So I like a lot of the professor's work, uh, but my teachers tell me I have to spend 10 years to complete my studies before I can work with these people that I admire. But then I discovered there is a online website called ARXIV or Archive run by the Cornell University. It's still mm -hmm. and so on the archive uh, with an X uh, network, I see that all the leading researchers at the time were publishing their latest papers even before those papers go to their journals. And that means that it's literally their latest research. What's even more amazing mm -hmm. is that when I send them email showing them uh, what I have thought about their paper, they actually responded. Wow. Like, over the internet, they didn't know I was just 15 years old anyway. Mm -hmm. so before long, we started working together. Of course, I doing uh, was doing quite minor parts, but still it's something, right? So I tell my principal that I don't have to wait for 10 years to mm -hmm. participate in the creation of new knowledge. Mm -hmm. I can, so right now with this very new invention called the World Wide Web, uh, mm -hmm. and then she read the printout of email and web pages, thought for a minute and say, oh, tomorrow you don't have to go to the middle school anymore. And I will cover for you, she said, which means that she will fake the records for me because Whoa. of compulsory education. Uh, we're long past the prosecution years uh, period now, so I can't <laughs> this. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you would have been charged if it was maybe a few years ago? That's, that's right. Uh, for a public servant, of course, I think it was uh, five years uh, or ten years. Uh, but because I w was talking about something that occurred in 1996, that's many, many years ago already. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, I think I have a strange case of optimism. I think mm. the public servants are the most innovative people because mm -hmm. of that experience. Mm -hmm. Wow, very interesting. 
So I imagine if I was to drop out of school at middle school, I would have felt lonely. I would have felt outside of, uh, you know, the general, I guess, majority society and so on and so forth. And I can imagine that I would have had certain challenges. But were these not relevant to you? Not at all, because uh, I just started attending university classes mm -hmm. because I have a research topic in mind. At the mm -hmm. time, in addition to natural language processing, mm -hmm. I also want to understand why people trust each other online so quickly, much quicker than face to face. Why is that? It's called swift trust. It's a phenomenon that all of us have experienced, but the psychological and social reason of that is not very clear at that time. It's also one of the research topic I'm interested in. So I also co-founded a few startups to work basically in the field of, for example, C2C auctioning uh, and uh, online like uh, meta search, search engines and so on, just to understand why people behave so differently and how we can make sure people behave in a pro-social manner online. So nowadays, of course, we'll call it a social network or a social media uh, and so on. But these words were not invented back in 96. And so basically I had a lot of community because it's a common question that's asked by many people around the time, the social entrepreneurs and the industrial people too. So you've embarked on so many different projects starting with, you know, before I'm sure you dropped out of middle school, but when you dropped out of middle school, you already had a research question which you wanted to um, pursue and understand. Um, and I think there's so much intrinsic motivation in you to address these questions, to, to allow those questions to emerge from you and so on. And I think more than the many different initiatives you've been a part of, it's this energy which you behold within you, um, which is extremely powerful and inspiring. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is that moves you forward and what are the things that you are trying to realize or perhaps answer? Yeah, uh, I think there are two main questions that both motivates you and that I seek answer. The first one is if people have very different positions and backgrounds, mm -hmm. how may we arrive to common values? That's question one. Mm -hmm. And the second question is given the common values that we have, can we innovate something without leaving anyone behind? That's mm -hmm. the second question. So a lot of my work is motivated by those two questions, which does not have a standard answer. Rather, it needs to be practiced from day to day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how are these questions relevant to what you're doing today as the digital minister of Taiwan? For example, uh, whenever there is a new technology arriving, people will think of very different uses. Mm -hmm. like for self-driving vehicles, you can easily think of a thousand different uses. Some of them are for economic prosperity, but then people worry that it will also make a negative impact on the environment. They think it should be used for environmental protection. Mm -hmm. Some of them may drive the science forward but then some people may worry that this will disrupt the social equality to make people who enjoy less opportunity enjoy even less opportunity if those self-driving vehicles or 5G are only available in the highly developed municipalities and places. So for each emerging technology, there's at least four different positions. If you talk about the sustainable goals globally, there's at least 16 different positions on any mm -hmm. new technology. And so that's relevant because the 17th goal of the SDGs are the partnership for the common goals. Mm -hmm. And digital can help make the environmental, social and business impact accountable to each other, translating different realms business impact, environmental and social impact into measurements that people can relate and interact, such as, for example, any, uh, you know, pollution on the air, it could mm -hmm. be collectively measured by people, any 
uh, water quality uh, can be collectively measured by people. The ocean, every part of the world, can basically be better understood, like the climate and so on, if we join together to find out what happens to these places in which metrics that we care about. But without digital technology, there is no way for us to share and remix from those different data sources. And so the digital is there so we can have a shared reality. That's for question one. For the question two about a common innovation, digital can help to make this innovation replicate in anywhere in the world, traveling by the speed of light. The mask map that I show you, which was invented in early February this year, gets running in Korea by March. And I met with video many people in Korea that brought this innovation there in one short month. Some of them are just 14 or 15 years old. They are very young people and they don't speak Mandarin. Um, Finjian Kyang, the person who wrote the map uh, for Korean people, doesn't speak Korean, but they both speak JavaScript, and, and that's enough. And the innovation can spread very quickly. Thank you so much. There's a lot of things that I do want to ask, um, in being inspired from those uh, what you just shared with us. But um, I want to move on to the output time because I want to provide everybody a time to uh, think a little bit as well. And before we go into that, um, there's going to be a little video. え、ま、皆さん、VTR モノゴトの捉え方を広げることが目的です。今回のアウトプットテーマは変えたい社会の風景を見つける。まずはガイドの考え方に触れてみましょう。Okay, Audrey, so today's output, the theme is creating new landscapes. Uh,変えたい社会の風景を見つける。and what we want to inspire uh, to the members that are here today is agency and uh, empowerment. Um, and the three sub questions uh, within this theme is number one, what is one thing around you you want to change? Number two, how do you want to change that one thing? Uh, and number three, how do you think you can participate in that change? So how do you think you can create that change? Um, and Audrey, so I want to ask you, how um, is there anything that you are working on right now that fits within the prompt of today's output? I think you're muted. <laughs> yes, uh, you talk about creating uh, a new landscape, but it occurs to me that I'm now occurring to you uh, as well as the map in portrait mode. It's you are right. Landscape. So if I rotate, it becomes landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think what this shows rather is a very simple idea that the web server, the person who code what you see is not the one who has the final say to what you actually receive. Mm -hmm. There is agency even in your browser that you can use to make sure that you do not, for example, get addicted to, for example, the Facebook feed. Uh -huh. I install on my browser something called a Facebook feed eradicator. It literally takes away the Facebook feed to me and replace it with a famous quote by uh -huh. um, a scientist or a philosopher. Uh -huh. and the part of Facebook that makes people addictive is invisible to me. It's like an advertisement blocker. But then the part of Facebook that are active, 
for example, dialing to a live stream, starting a messenger conversation, or visiting a profile or a page. Basically, anything like I search for a hashtag and participate in conversation, it's intrinsic. But if you keep refreshing the feed, it's extrinsic. It's mm -hmm. determined by the algorithm. So by installing an extension to take that away, and only keep the intrinsic part, I regain agency in my relationship with Facebook. That is just one example. And you can do so too. Just search Facebook feed eradicator. Mm -hmm. So there requires the intrinsic motivation to create that change, I'm sure. And the hope today is that um, this serves as an opportunity to exercise that intrinsic motivation. Um, so for the Japanese users that are here today, I want to uh, show in the display screen uh, what the prompt is today again. Um, テロップお願いします。はい、皆さん、今回のアウトプットはこちらです。解体社会の風景を見つけるで。え、2、どのようにその風景を変えたいですか。3、どうしたらその変化を実現できると思いますか。え、皆さんぜひ主体的に考えてもらうきっかけになればいいなという風に思いますので、よろしくお願いいたします。はい、テロップありがとうございました。
um, which will help you understand how to exactly participate in the outputting. えー、皆さん、アウトプットの時間にこれから入っていきます。アウトプットは日本語でも大丈夫ですが、できれば英語で挑戦してみてほしいなと思います、えー。ここからアウトプットの時間になります。皆さん、質問などいただいてますね。全部答えられなくて本当にすいません。後半でどしどし聞いていきたいと思いますので、まだ聞けてない、どうしても聞きたいやつがあれば、セーブして後で送ってください。それでは皆さん、アウトプットの時間に入っていきます。VTR ご覧くださいここからはアウトプットの時間ですこの時間はガイドの視点をインスピレーションに自分なりに考えてみることが目的です今回のアウトプットテーマは変えたい社会の風景を見つける周りを眺めたときに違和感のある風景や変えていきたい社会のワンシーンを見つけどんな風に変えたいか考えてみましょう。回答項目は次の通りです。一、どんな風景ですか。二、どのように変えたいですか。三、どうしたら実現できると思いますか。アウトプット提出画面を下にスクロールすると、投稿例が掲載されているので。参考にしてみてください。時間は十五分間。それではアウトプットスタートです
残り時間は10分です。
残り時間は5分です残り時間は3分です。残り時間は1分ですまだ完成していないメンバーは途中経過を投稿しましょうこの時間が終わると投稿できなくなります残り時間は30秒ですそろそろセッション動画に戻りましょう
Okay, so everybody's worked on their outputs, made their submissions, and we have a lot of different works and views coming in, which we will uh, touch on later. So from here, we start uh, what is called the feedback time. So everybody submitted their work, and in Inspire High, we really value feedback. Um, and so I want to ask you, uh, how is feedback important to you in your work? Ah, you're muted. <laughs> yes, when we first rationed the masks, um, the system that the civic technologist devised actually hurt some pharmacies because they will collect the IC cards and then slowly swipe them and ask the customer to return in the evening to pick up the medical mask to save time. However, in our system, it will then show that they still have many masks available and gradually declining in number. And then people will show up thinking they still have some mask left, but actually they're just slowly swiping the IC card on behalf of their customers. Mm -hmm. And so it created a burden for the pharmacist to have to explain. And people also sometimes say, but this map show you still have some masks. Are you hiding them? And so on, <laughs> creating social uh, tension. And so every time everyone call the line 1922 can report this situation to us. And every Thursday, we make a new version of the system. So to display the rationing rules and times for the pharmacy to make the pharmacist uh, a tool where they can click a button and mute themselves from the map. They will disappear from the map once the, their uh, IC card collection uh, is finished for the day and mm -hmm. so on. So feedback is essential in making sure that technology work for the people instead of asking people to conform to technology. Feedback is the social innovation's most important thing. Feedback is social innovation's most important thing. I think a lot of people don't feel that they have agency over technology. So I think what you provided there is extremely inspiring for a lot of people who feel like they live in a technology first kind of world. So I'm sure in your everyday work, um, you exercise giving feedback all the time. Do you have any advice on how people should give feedback? You just give me that advice and I will repeat and I quote, unmute yourself. <laughs> I think that's beautiful. Unmute yourself. Do you believe that a lot of people are too muted? Yes. Uh, and it's muted by other people because of the recording quality, right? When I sit here in the chair, uh, your studio already muted me as we previously <laughs> talked about, but I was not aware of the fact that I was <laughs> muted. And so the feedback that you give me raised my agency, realizing that, oh, I can unmute myself too. I don't have to wait for you to unmute me. It's the same for civic participation. Too many people think they have to be 18 years old, 20 years old, finish the college or whatever before being a participation uh, force in the citizenry. So that we make a distinction between participating citizens and people who merely live here, like the very young people or foreign immigrants and so on. But I think this is a unuseful, not useful distinction to make to me everybody who can unmute themselves through citizens initiatives, petitions, hashtags, Instagram challenges. These are all the very different ways that you can unmute yourself even if you are not yet 18 years old. Thank you so much. Do you have any advice on when unmuting yourself, how perhaps to voice your opinions? Yes, wait for a couple seconds. Uh, for the other person to finish what they are talking. Otherwise, there may be interference as we uh, experience in the beginning of this talk. And even though it sounds very cool in the movies, uh, especially by director Nolan, uh, but uh, the other people will feel 
that, oh, you're interrupting me uh, without listening what I have to say. So practice active listening. You can set a time boundary saying, I will pay all my attention to you for five minutes and listen to you, especially if they are a elderly person or a government official like a minister. Uh, but then the young people can say, after you have your five minutes, I ask you to also give me five minutes of attention and where I will unmute myself and provide my output. And that arrangement, this called time boxing, is very important. And I see it's also what Inspire High is doing. So it's an art form to unmute yourself, but I it's also equally an art form to know when to mute yourself. Thank you so much. So everybody, it's time to provide feedback to the other members' work. 皆さんにフィードバックをしていただきます。それではどうぞ、
フィードバックは残り時間30秒ですアウトプットを見ている場合はセッション動画に戻りましょう All right, Audrey. 
So we finished the feedback round. Mina san, feedback, arigato gozaimashita. Sugoi mori agatte mashita. We saw a lot of people giving a lot of feedback. Thank you so much, everybody, for your participation. So from here, we're going to be going over the works together with Audrey. And Audrey will be providing his feedback towards each one of your work. How exciting. So here we go. Let's start with this first piece. Okay, so this is the first one. It's in Japanese, so I'm going to translate. So in Japan, there's a lot of shoplifting in the world. Uh, in Japan, it's a problem. And in fact, they say Japan ranks as number two with the most shoplifting uh, within a year. And the person who posted this wants to decrease that uh, for the economic damage that it's causing. And the solution that she is offering or the way in which she believes she can participate um, is by attaching IC tags to the products and putting cameras within the store so that there can be heightened surveillance. So, Audrey, do you have any um, feedback, insights, uh, perspectives you would want to share regarding this? Thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, surveillance uh, is a way to discourage people's uh, behavior if it is purely for economic reasons, because surveillance is basically a threat that you will be fined uh, and the expectation of fining uh, will uh, make people less likely to shoplift. On the other hand, some people shoplift out of necessity or habit. Uh, that is to say, they are in it for the acceleration of it, for the for the fun of it, basically, for um, feeling that, oh, I'm shoplifting, I'm a uh, delinquent person, uh, I'm cool. Uh, and, and that's one motivation, and that's intrinsic, uh, and for <laughs> that, that uh, they really have an economic need, uh, and of course, they're driven by hunger or whatever. The, the hunger part, of course, with the social safety net, it's actually easier to address with community support, with no wasted food, food banks, and so on. We can reduce the hunger-based shoplifting. But the fun, like uh, I'm breaking the law because breaking law is cool, uh, that sort of shoplifting actually may heighten because when you put the surveillance camera and so on in, it only prompts them to also learn about cybersecurity hacking, uh, about even more ways uh, to work around the system and become even more professional criminals. Uh, and so uh, I'm not saying that it's not useful. It may be useful for some cases, but it's also useful to also find outlets and to make sure that they become um, more creative people like white hat hackers who can also look into a system for its problems to find its vulnerabilities, but you reward them for essentially discovering that, hey, here is a hidden way to shoplift. Here is a hidden way to uh, get break into the password protected e-commerce system. <laughs> you can do so with a bug bounty uh, and many other ways to engage those white hat hackers or even encourage those out of box thinking as part of education. Uh, once they understand that the society rewards white hat hacking, then black hat hacking will seem very boring uh, and not that rewarding because they will not be seen as community hero or national heroes. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of the takeaways within that was that it's really important to address the contextual system as well as the, um, I suppose, the negative externality of the, of the actual act of surveilling and that it may not really resolve the issue if you're simply focused on, on, on the behavior of that one individual in that moment. Um, thank you so much. We have a lot of comments coming in. Um, <laughs> Sora-san, shoplifting is a profession, damn. Yes, I, it does definitely exist. In Japan, there was a movie called Manbiki Kazoku, the shoplifting family that won uh, the Cannes uh, uh, movie festival. And it portrays uh, a family in poverty who is a professional shoplifter. So indeed, they do exist. Okay, well, I'd like to move on to the next one. Here we are. Okay, so this one's also in Japanese from Uchi-san. 
Um, so in his or her school, uh, there's stairs. And for people who are not able to climb those stairs, such as people injured or are on uh, wheelchairs, they're not able to access the classrooms. So she wants to, or she or he wants to make it possible for anybody to access those classrooms. And the proposition here is to introduce or to uh, act towards introducing elevators in their schools. Audrey, how is this one? Yeah, in the Social Innovation Lab, we not only build a elevator, but we also make sure that it can be operated even if you move very slowly, that it has voice guidance and that it uh, moves in a way that allows a wheelchair to easily access it. And there's also a kind of sky bridge that connects different parts of the social innovation lab and it's built in a very sturdy way so that even people with a heavy wheelchair can feel very comfortable traveling on that sky bridge. It's very important, of course. But of course, there are also parts of the world like very high mountains uh, where people want to experience, but mm -hmm. uh, simply impossible. Uh, for a person in wheelchair to climb, mm -hmm. for example, to the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high. It's very, Whoa. Difficult. It's very difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. It's difficult even for able-bodied people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so for these, and also for very uh, deep underwater, like uh, Titanic-like ships, that people want to tour. Again, very few people in the world are professional divers that can dive to this deep. And even if they can, each trip may damage the cultural artifact of that ship. So what we do is that we build self-driving drones and self-driving robots that goes underwater and goes to the high mountains uh, and relay the information uh, with 360 cameras so that people can put on their virtual reality classes and still interact with those outdoor areas. And so this technology has been used in classroom as well. I personally taught people in high school and also primary school in a virtual reality space. And in there, I shrink my avatar to the same height as they are so that we become more like classmates. They don't have to literally look up on me. And this is also how we can put ourselves into each other's shoes. And with 5G technology, like uh, with XR space, it's a startup in Taiwan, you can bring the headset anywhere. You don't need a Wi-Fi or fiber optic anymore. You can use the headset to scan your surrounding and immediately bring other people around the world into your virtual classroom, but still enjoy your co-presence. And this is, I think, very exciting area where digital can bring more people with different abilities who cannot travel that easily. Maybe it's uh, all of us when we are 80 or 90 years old, it, it will happen to all of us. Uh, and that will still enable our social, even outdoor participation. So that drone example, as well as that digital room example, I think are great uh, examples of technology, digital technology, allowing higher accessibility and flexibility for people to share experiences, as well as uh, engage in dialogue. And in the case of, for example, the drone going into the higher mountains or other um, 360 camera devices going into the deep sea, that also expands our ability to experience these. And there's um, everybody in the ideal world would have accessibility those things, to those things. And in the example of the school, um, perhaps one uh, innovative approach would be to go digital and allow everybody to participate inside that space. I think that's amazing. And there's a, a, a very lively discussion which is happening in Japanese on the comments within um, the app right now around how the difference in uh, budgets it, it, among uh, municipalities that allows or disallows this type of um, innovation to happen um, as well as uh, allowing or disallowing the implementation of elevators. And there was even an example that was being uh, mentioned here around how the elevators are only accessible for teachers. 
Um, so it's very interesting that we have uh, certain, like these types of examples or, or realities as well uh, existing in our world today. Maybe there's, you want to briefly uh, respond to that. I would uh, only say that uh, in Taiwan, we consider accessibility uh, like broadband accessibility, like elevator is a human right. So it needs to fit everybody's needs. Actually, in our 5G deployment, we make sure that the spectrum auction, the money that the telecoms bid, they have a lot of uh, extra money because we design the auction this way so that we reward them to first put those co-presence technologies to the most rural, most remote places that has the least budget for this kind of accessibility, either online or offline, so that they will not be excluded from the rest of the country, but rather can be included through digital opportunity centers. And you are spot on when you say we can be all in the same classroom because we also have a program where a large municipal university student pairs with their companion in remote or rural places and show them essentially the world because they don't lack the broadband. What they lack is the understanding of the possibility that the broadband uh, allows them to have. Thank you so much. Um, I want to quickly move on to the next one. This is the third piece and it's in English um, and I will quickly translate for the non-English speakers. Um, so let me open this up on my screen real quick. So, ko, san. Um, this is a picture of me studying agriculture. Uh, agriculture income tends to be low, even though um, farms support our foods. Uh, number two, introduce IT to agriculture to share information, develop new product routes, and improve productivity. Uh, number three, now I want to develop an application for agriculture. How is this one, Audrey? Yeah, I think this is great. In Taiwan, we also face <coughs> an issue where the younger people are more interested in programming the drones uh, than tending to the land. Mm -hmm. But uh, fortunately, the drones can tend the land. Uh, not only they can help uh, the spraying, the seeding, the harvesting, all sorts of issues, but also it makes sure that the young people, instead of just doing things uh, like all day long, they can spend their time thinking about branding and hashtags and stories to tell and measuring environmental impact and communicating to those uh, social responsibility uh, programs of large corporations and universities while their robots help them to do the farming. Uh, and I think this is important because the value of the land needs to be experienced by more people in order for more people to cherish the land. And so the outreach is, I think, as important as tending the land. If the part of tending the land is repetitive, that's where robots can help us. But robots cannot actually tell us their life experiences. Maybe they could uh, about uh, 50 years from now, but certainly nowadays we don't have robots that have a life experience as we do. Uh, and so uh, we need to share our life experiences experiences more. So I uh, wish you the best uh, with the app and also make sure that your story is easily spread by other people. If it touches people and each person on average share to more than one people, then you have a R value of above one. <laughs> it's called viral marketing. Uh, but <laughs> if your story rather touches a person, but that person isn't touched enough because it makes it difficult for them to share, uh, for example, on social media, then your story will then not reach a lot of people. Then you end up having to do most of the storytelling by yourself. And in which case it's like farming without the help of the machines. Thank you so, so much. So it's extremely important that you are also being seen and shared and that there are other people who are, well, I guess this actually relates very much to your, um, the concept of open transparency, which you um, hold very important uh, into your, um, in, in your activities. And being more transparent and sharing with the world is extremely important, particularly in this digital age. 
uh, where that is the means of communicating with people beyond your immediate friends and family. Um, so yeah, this app sounds exciting. Um, and this is the end of our feedback session. There's so many more ideas that were generated through um, this output session. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your participation. So sorry that we're not able to go through each and every one of them. Uh, the works will continue to exist inside the app, so please feel free to go out and check them out after this session is over because I've been looking through them and there's just other really interesting perspectives and really important issues that people are speaking about in this space. So. We are now entering our final round of questions. We have five minutes left, that's all, and Audrey has to leave. Um, so everybody, now is your chance. Please post questions uh, which you may want to have answers to, and I'll try my best to pick them up. So I want to ask the first question, um, which is um, around the point which we were discussing earlier uh, around social innovation and uh, your work. Um, and you mentioned that there were certain examples that you wanted to speak about, which address the second question which you are exploring, um, which is around, if my memory is correct, around digital technology and then bridging the gaps between uh, issues. Um, and I want to hand it over to you. Yes. Uh, so when I talk about an app that uh, goes viral, I think of yesterday uh, when our president gave the presidential hackathon award to five winning team. The uh, one of which is called Circuit Plus uh, or Feng Cha in Mandarin, uh, literally uh, serving you tea. Uh, and this is a culture in Taiwan where people can uh, freely serve as refill stations. So instead of um, buying new plastic bottles, it shows how many people. Wow, a lot of people now. Actually, that's 5,000 people more than yesterday uh, who <laughs> downloaded this app and how many plastic bottles they have reduced simply by looking around in this map and see which refill stations are nearby and which kind of water they provide so that they can also rate and comment on the quality of the water. And just like Pokemon Go, uh, get the coins by refilling at different water stations and redeem it uh, for the uh, specialty drinks and agricultural products um, that the partnering tea shops and so on are providing. So it's both a way for placemaking, for people to understand their culture around their community, but also a way to get people who get into the habit of buying plastic bottle to get into a new game where they're bottle to refill is just uh, a part of the game, but after they participate in this game for two months, their behavior will change and they will no longer buy new plastic bottles and cause more sea waste. And rather they will do this in the entire carbon neutral way while getting plenty of water, which is important around this time of heat and extreme weather. Thank you so much. So that's a brilliant idea. And we have a, a similar app in Japan called My Mizu. So everybody check it out. Um, so I have, uh, I think, which will be the final question, um, which is you inspire a lot of people through your activities and through your way of being. And a lot of people here today are asking the question of how can I uh, also be somebody who impacts the world positively and makes positive change and changes the world? Um, do you have any words of advice? Yes. Um, so I would quote my favorite poet, Leonard Cohen, uh, who said, and I quote, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. So make sure that the next time you see a crack in something, maybe a chance of shoplifting, instead of doing anything that's for your personal benefit, write it up take a photo, share it with the hashtag, and before long, this crack in the society will become a social object that people can gather and talk about and innovate upon common values. And so instead of just having one standardized answers as the last century's education system uh, teaches us, there will be many different possibilities that's offered by the whole spectrum of the society. So don't do it alone do it with the entire society. There's no perfect offering. 
Thank you so much. So we have one final question and two if we have the time. So today you were able to communicate with many uh, uh, students today through this space. How was that experience? Well, the experience is excellent. Uh, I feel that we are literally in the same room. I can even see the uh, shape of the plant uh, behind you. It's beautiful sunlight. <laughs> I think the plant uh, is there to remind us that although they are not speaking in human language, humans are here as stewards, as caretakers of the planet. So all the things that we're doing is not for our generation, it's for future generations. And the generation's ideas of what's a good world must not be foreclosured, foreclosed by our generation's ideas of progress, of GDP, of linear growth, or things like that. We need to make sure that this plant or its offspring is enjoying an Earth that is better when we lock out of the world than we lock into the world. Thank you, Audrey. Final question, can we change the world? Yes, and we are changing the world right now. The world is changing because of your participation in this conversation. If you understand the idea that was spreading and spread to at least 1.01 person on average, that idea will catch a uh, fire and become the new norm for the society. Numeric model shows that when three quarter of people in Taiwan put on the mask, the virus will be gone. And people understood the logic and then understand the epidemiology and did whatever we can to get three quarters of people masked as quick as possible. That's why we won against the coronavirus with no lockdowns. But for each person, it's really literally just washing their hands with soap and putting on mask. Seems like a small thing, but it changes the world. If you can understand the science behind it and teach it to at least 1.01 .01 other person. Thank you so much, Audrey. This has been amazing, and I think everybody has been inspired, inspired today. I hope you have a brilliant rest of the day, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Bye, Audrey. Bye. Taiwan IT 大臣オードリー・タンさんと考える社会はどう変えられるはいかがでした